go. Hearn and Bell, you talk the talk. Tone, we were talking last night. Um, me and you exchanged a couple of messages. And we were talking about the success of our series so far. You obviously clearly think that it's down to you. I think it's probably more down to me. At this point, and I didn't think yeah. of this before the success of the show, yeah. I would like to point out at this moment in time, I am the A-side. It is yeah. the value show. And actually, I felt like in the negotiations to this show, I kind of like tricked you on that because I just put it straight in. Tony's the Hearn and Bell show. And I was expecting a text back going... Shouldn't it be the Bellew and Hearn show? But I guess at this stage in your career, you just happens to be part of the success tone. <laughs> Do you know what, mate? You never cease to amaze me. Uh, you have always been the A-side. You are the only man in boxing, but you are one of very few. Makes absolutely millions and millions of pounds without getting punched in the face. So, so as I've said to you, you know, before, I, only, you, you know I only take a small percentage of fighters, so you know that. You know that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, a small percentage of all the fighters, oh, yeah, not just of the fighter. <laughs> so, this, listen, it's, it's been good so far. I'm this, long um, it's in. this show's actually doing really well. I mean, we should call it award winning because it's inevitable we will be winning some awards whenever they present themselves, <laughs> especially if I own the awards or I'm sponsoring the awards. Um, <laughs> we definitely win. But this week, we've done, we've done like three solid weeks. We've done Ant Middleton and Del Boy, which is a great show. Mm. We did uh, Bisping and Ariel, which was great. Then last week we did Dillian White, Darren Till, fantastic. Mm. I kind of feel like we've we've brown nosed the UFC enough. Me and Dana okay. have become very close pals. We've been exchanging <laughs> text messages. I, I, he probably can't believe what's he's probably thinking. What's Hearn up to? Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. got his new show and he's just plugging UFC. So again, we won't go on about that. But well done to mm. them because I think they've done another show. I'm losing count of the amount of shows they've done. I think it's gone done three so far. Time which was fantastic. But this show is all about Project Restart, if you like. You know, you saw um, our plans at the HQ, Matchroom mm -hmm. Boxing HQ Garden, which the media have called my back garden, but it is the HQ's back garden. It used to be your back garden. It did. And a funny story is, actually, uh, when we first signed you, or one of the first times uh, we, we met, actually, we had a press conference. Yeah. Remember, I think it was Andre Ward and Carl Frog, and we were, like, announcing our team, and you were there. And I didn't know you too well. And you sort of come out and we walked into the garden and you went, is this where you grew up? And I went, yeah, it is. And I said to you, mate, you have no idea. I had tough it was. <laughs> yeah, you know. And that was, uh, it's going to work well. I mean, I just felt that one thing I'm seeing about this studio stuff and the arena stuff, I want to try and create that sort of amphitheater mm. of a visual impact for the viewer when they turn in and there's drones over sky and the house is lit up and there's fireworks going off in the field to try and also give the fighters that mm. sense of shit this is so like, saying an exhibition this is real you know the visuals were brilliant mate and as i said uh, i think the thing that people would get would be walking into an environment like that would be fight club and yeah. that, that's the first thing that came to my mind mm. uh it, it's it just looks unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I think the fighters will welcome something new, number one as well. It'll be outdoors. So it, it's just, it works really, really well, in my opinion. And the way it looked, as I say, to the visuals was brilliant. Fight Club came to mind. Imagine the boys turning up. What's the first rule of Fight Club? No one talks about Fight Club. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's what it is. And the amount of people that have messaged me as well going, mate, we called it Fight Camp because Fight Club. I might actually change it. I like that. But the amount of people that have messaged me, not just fighters saying, let me in, let me in. But like people I know, businessmen, fans who come to, how do we get, how do we get in? How do we get in? <laughs> it's like, no, it's closed off. There's no, no spectators. Yeah, but like, what, there must be a seat. You could just you know, you could watch from the office. Do you know what I mean? So I think over time, you know, like I think I, I was speaking to AJ about it yesterday and he's, he trained at the office for a lot, a, a lot long time when he started his career. And he said, I love that. I love that. I said, yeah, but do you like think of it everywhere you box? Yeah. I mean, Wembley said, and he said, Ed, and he said to me something that actually resonated. He goes, do you know what? He goes, I think some people just don't want to fight. I said, mm. what do you mean? He said, like, I think some people talk about, yeah, this and that, but actually they're quite happy to sort of sit out and do you actually want to get in there? He said, mm. I would love to fight at the office. I said, mm. really? He said, yeah, it'd be unbelievable. It'd be so different. And, you know, and I just, I, I think he's right in this, a lot of the feedback I'm getting from fighters is sort of 80% are saying, 
oh, please just hurry up, stick me in. Obviously, you've got the proportion of those people that financially need to get in the ring as well. Mm. But I am, I am getting a small group of fighters that are like, no, I'm all, you know, give yeah. me a buzz when it's all back to normal, you know? And I think I'm, the ones that step up right now, mm. the ones that are willing to go forward, you know, we spoke, you messaged me yesterday about some of the fighters you're managing as well. They're ready, yeah. you know, get them in. You, you've got to be ready and you've got to take mm. advantage of because you will get jumped in terms mm. of the line, you know, in terms of the activity line, the profile line, the rankings line. You got mm. this is what you do. You know what I mean? Definitely. I think it's an opportunity that's going to arise for a number of fights and it's all about how they perceive it and how they jump at their opportunity because it will be huge. I think what AJ's saying there to you is very, very true in some scenarios. I think what it is is a lot of fighters are happy with the tag of being known as a boxer. A lot of happy, a lot of fighters are happy that, you know, I am this, I am that, but no one really wants to go out and prove it. And I think it's, it's been shown over the last few years. This going forward will actually be a massive help because if you can create the atmosphere in the Matchroom HQ, that is just another venue we can explore and go with whenever you feel like. And it, as I say, it, it's, a, it's a plus and it's a bonus that's come out of this. Listen, no one wants to be in this position, but we have to adapt and we have to adjust and make things work. And that arena is going to work, mate. It's as simple as that. Well, this is Project Restart. The main focus of our discussions today is football. We've got three blinding guests. And actually, although people are going to feel like this is a put-up job, you know, we've got Jamie Carragher on first, your pal. Then we've got Joey Barton, your pal as well. But also, we've got oh. Troy Deeney. And actually, the mad thing is, is that we invited Troy Deeney. But I didn't know the guys had done it. And I told you, what about Joey Barton? Because he's outspoken. Then I realised those two had had their own beef. They won't be on together, but they have got very different views Jeez. of Project Restart. I want to go to, like, to the to the public, to the man on the street. As a father, you and me, mm. and I have to say, like this has been a blessing and also the biggest pain in the ass of all time. I mean, doing the yeah. homeschooling. It teaches you more about yourself, actually, than, than any day in the office can ever do. Where do you sit about going back to school? Because, like, every... June 1 is like a type, I want to get the kids out of the house, do you know what I mean? And I want to get yeah. them back. I want to get them back to school. Mm. But are you going to send yours or are you going to wait? How do you sit on it all? I mean, as a parent yeah. and watching this, I think everyone's got mixed opinions. Mm. I'm not going to lie. First thing is you're going to run it by her and see what she has the final say on when it comes to the kids. <laughs> uh, second of all is our city's not going back on June the 1st. Joe Anderson has come That's out on here and said that our children are not going back on the first. Uh, so, I, do you know what, mate? I just... You know your man, out. bro. You know your man. Yeah. Mm. I've, I've met him a couple of times, and he's been helpful to us. I remember when we did the fight at Goodison Park as well. Yeah, I know Joe. I've seen him say a few things lately that are bang controversial. And I, yes. that bad comment there, I watched something on social media this morning where he basically said, not interested in the government. You know, mm. I'm, I'm telling you, our schools are not going back on June the 1st. Mm. He's quite opinionated, Joe Anderson, isn't he? He is, matey. And, and the thing with Joe is it's it's everything from the heart. It's not as it's not might not be the right thing to say or the politically correct thing to say or do, but he absolutely loves the city and means what he says. Uh, and he'll stick by it, mate. So that may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing in some scenarios, but for now, mate, we ain't going back on the first. Uh, and paramount for me is is people's health. You know, one thing I don't want to see is we get back to normal quicker than we are supposed to, and then we have another spike. That's the disaster worry for everybody, uh, and that's the one thing I don't want to see. So health is paramount, that's what I will say, and that is the most important thing from, from my perspective. I understand people need to be entertained and want to be entertained, and the football does need to come back. Yes, I, I see that point, but understand this, mate. We can come back from this eventually. You can't come back from death. There's no comeback from that. So when, when people start dying, if this illness mutates and gets any worse and learns to attack younger people, then we're in a world of trouble. And it's all going to be for the sake of, oh, well, we need football back. Oh, well, we needed this back. If things can be done like the UFC done, then I'm all for it, 100%. But you have to be able to 100% confirm that people are going to be okay, mate. Well, I think uh, time to talk football. No better to kick off the neutral view with your pal, Sky Sports pundit, Jamie Carragher. We're talking a little bit of boxing. We're talking a little bit of football. 
And uh, actually, Jay, the funny thing is, we've actually got Joey Barton on next and Troy Deeney. Oh, wow. Not together, but actually, they've, they've both realised they've been semi <laughs> to come on the show. It's like, well, I've already, been, I've already been into Barton. I think he's coming on the football show next week. Yeah. Uh, on Friday. I saw a couple of his tweets and I thought, oh, yeah, we'll have a bit of him. Yeah, anyway, I mean, you know, <laughs> I knew you were talking that. about school and about sending kids back to school. We were talking about Joe Anderson, the mayor of Liverpool as well. He comes out with some, I mean, he's got his own opinions, hasn't he? He seems like he's going to do yeah. whatever he wants to do rather than what the government say. But when we talk about football, Jamie, obviously, from the business perspective and Sky and the clubs and stuff like that, it's a, it's a must start. But we're trying to bring boxing back at the moment and it has got so many problems. I can only imagine the politics internally going on with football right now. Well, the problem with football, Eddie, is no one involved in the game has got a garden big enough to put a match on. <laughs> Eddie <the end>, <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest problem. If, someone, if we had a garden as big as yours... Wait, can I just tell you a little story, right? My, you know, everybody is guided by their parents, right? You've got my old man, who is Flash Harry from Dagnum, right? And then you've got my mum, who's also from the East End but he's double humble and like, you know. I thought you were going to call her Flash then, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, she's the one I'm scared of the most. She no. texts me yesterday going, I've just read your article in the Daily Mail. Who do you think you are? I'm like, <laughs> your garden, your garden, like what are you? I said, I didn't say it's my garden. I said, it's the garden. Yeah. Oh, you know, my garden, all this. You, 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 <laughs> Well, I am. That's what I am. I'd love to have seen her put you straight. Anyway, it's gonna no, but the 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 football, Ed, it's it's a difficult one. Uh, Really, I watched the Bundesliga yesterday, and people were criticising it and saying, "Oh, it's not the same." But as you know yourself, nothing's going to be the same in in anything that we do now for probably a long time. Maybe the next six months, maybe till next year. Whether it's even going to shops now, when you go to get your essential bits, you're queuing outside Mm -hmm. the shop. Nothing is going to be the same. So I actually quite enjoyed the, the German game yesterday just because it was a game of football, to be honest. And, you know, I saw a lot of people on social media saying this is not football, football without fans is nothing. And that is totally spot on. But that's football in a pandemic now. We've got to get used to it. That's yeah. the way it's, it's going to be. And what we should remember is we're very lucky as professionals that we play in front of a crowd to actually get to that level. We've played in front of nobody when we were playing as a kid, Sunday league football, playing for the school. Mm playing for the reserves of your team, England of the 21s, there's all these teams and all these ways of playing football that, that means so much to so many people. There's, there's no one watching them. It's just mm. that we're very lucky and fortunate when we get to the real top level, that we play in front of thousands and, and that's the game we all watch and we all love, of course it is. But there's so much football without fans that means a lot to so many people and, and that's what we just got to get used to. But I, I think the league will start. I, I think the work the Premier League have put in, I think they've put in a lot of work now, organisation with testing. I don't think that's going to get thrown away. Uh, of course, you need to get the players involved and it needs to be safe. But certainly there's a template yesterday in what they've done in Germany. They're further ahead than us. But just, uh, I'm just fingers crossed we can get it going. People I'm saying, Jay, it doesn't matter. It's, it's crazy, as you've just touched on there, which is a very valid point. And the Sunday league, let me tell you, mate, there can be no one on the sidelines and it means the world to these lads. And that's Sunday league where not on the stake, there's no money at stake, there's no leagues that... It's just lads getting stuck in on a Sunday. Tony, Jay, saying, I, I used to watch my mate for school, boys. They, they care that. It's been taken away from football at the top level. And, and not just football, but mm. all sport as well. Where you talk, when you started fighting, you, know, you weren't mm. dreaming about becoming a pay-per-view fighter. I mean, obviously, no. lucky. And, um, you know, we all know what happened. But I think that it's more mm-hmm. about a situation where when you started out, you were down the rotunda. You wanted to, to become a world champion. ABA titles. Exactly. They both ABA titles, mate. And that's the same. But when we look at now the situation in football, I can just imagine, Jamie, where literally agents now are speaking to the clubs and to the chairmen and saying, I don't know, my guy, you know, he's not really sure about this. And I'd be doing the same if I was an agent as well. Uh, you're an audible, you, you know. You <laughs> are <laughs> audible. <laughs> I don't work in football, but I can imagine agents. So, I mean, we, you know, You've got the elements of the players. Like, do, do you think the players, Jamie, want to play? If you were playing right now, especially if your contract was up at the end of June and you might be asked to, to extend for another three or four weeks you know, beyond your contract, mm. 
Do you think they're sitting at home right now going, oh, hurry up, I just can't wait to get back to training or I can't get back to playing football? Honestly. I, I, th- I, think, I, I think I'm most pleased with one to play uh, from, from who I speak to. I, I, speak, I wouldn't say I speak to every player, of course I don't, but when you speak to managers and you ask their opinion on their squad, and I mean, I think the majority of players want to come back. This is what we're hearing. I think what, what you said was good there in terms of players being out of contract and they're a, a case of, you know, do I want to just come back for a month? Do I want to risk anything? And maybe I've then got no contract going forward if something, you know, obviously the, the worst happens. But I mean, I was speaking to a manager in the lower leagues and he said his players are desperate to get back, the ones who are out of contract because they almost want to put themselves in the shop window. Because no one's actually seen them play for two months. People just forget about players or who's doing what, who's doing when. Obviously, this has taken over. And some players want to get out there and, and actually show themselves. Now, I totally get it that there'll be players who, who may be not quite sure. And they probably have wives and family members who are thinking, let's be honest, Lord, you're a top Premier League player now. You've probably got 10, 20 million in the bank. And you've got a wife at home saying, do you really need to take, even if it's a, a half a percent risk? Do you really need, you know, we're set for life. Why would you even try and miss this? So you may even get, you know, players, uh, family members more than the actual players really are putting uh, pressure That's on. Phenomenal. I think, I, I must say, I've I done a newspaper article on it and I said, I think Premier League training grounds or football clubs will be the safest industry in this country to go back to work. In that, you know, the money they have to put, I mean, what other, what other industry is getting tested two or three times a week, you know, when, when they go back into the workplace? I mean, so it is, I mean, I think the Premier League are doing everything that they possibly can. But yes, can the risk ever be taken away until there's a vaccine? No. From a Premier League perspective, do you see a reset in, in the wages and the transfer fees coming on? Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and people are saying there won't be transfers this summer. And, and I think there still will be movement. The problem you've got is, the, the top clubs will always have money. They'll have less money this summer. There's no doubt about that. But then you think the price of things are going to be cheaper because the teams near the bottom will be that desperate to get some sort of money in. If they don't actually sell players, maybe teams near the bottom of the Premier League, they, they need to bring money in. So actually the top teams, would they actually also look at this as, it sounds terrible to say, but also almost like an opportunity where they can get players on the cheap because there are teams who are really struggling in this situation and the prices of a player before was maybe 40, 50 million is now 25 million. TV money, who knows how that's going to work with, with Sky at this moment. I'm sure that'll be fine, but there's so much money going to be lost here uh, now, I think, from football clubs and a lot more than we actually think. I mean, you know that from the boxing side of things and I, I, I'm just a player, Tony being a boxer, we just... The first thing you think is is your wages, isn't it? Okay, hmm. getting that yourself. So much more around it. I can really imagine having that conversation with Tony if he was still fighting. <laughs> Tony, obviously, <laughs> that's difficult right now. There's no gates, less money coming in. I need you to take a few quid less. Fuck off, lad. <laughs> no, nah, you know what, mate? It, it, that's what I'd say is that this is going to affect the people, as Jamie said before, for Premier League footballers. They've got the families, the wives on the side saying, listen, we're set for life. We don't need to do this. Why are you taking an unnecessary risk? For anyone who's living in and amongst them of an elderly age, they are genuinely taking a risk. So I get that and I understand why they wouldn't even give it a thought to do it. On the other hand, there's some people out there who live who live week to week, mouth to mouth, mate. It's really tough. So I get they just need to earn money. And if you're a professional boxer, mate, it's the only way you're getting paid. You only fight when you get paid. So, you know, you only get paid in your fight. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, how does it work with... Because there's talk of, obviously, social distancing and how can you do that in football? I think, obviously, anyone who goes onto the football pitch is, is being tested and is, is coronavirus-free, I would, I would imagine, when he goes on. But they were actually talking about the stats of football and how, how many times you've had that close to people uh, on the pitch. It's, it's a lot less than what you actually think when you look at the stats. But boxing, you're talking about putting something on in your garden. I mean, it, it's... You're basically half a yard away from each other yeah. for, you and know, constantly, thirty-six yeah. minutes. Yeah, and that's why I think Jamie will probably be back later than mm. football. I think it sounds like football are trying for June, but might sort of go into early July. We'll probably go middle back end of July, and it's yeah. our last couple of weeks have just been speaking to doctors, speaking to testing agencies. I mean, it's like challenges you never thought you'd even have to deal with. So our facility is we have a, a hotel at the bottom of the road, not our hotel, we're not, we're not Neville, but, you know, we, we have a hotel at the bottom of the road 
which fighters will go into, they will go straight into a testing center, they will be given their key to their room. They get tested, they go straight to their room. They wait in their room until they get the results of their test. Okay, when they get their results, if they're a negative, they will be able to go to fight camp, which will be up at our headquarters mm -hmm. you know, for the way in for the press conference, etc. Everybody that is in that fight camp will have had negative tests. The problem is more so is the preparation for fighting, the sparring. I'm speaking mm. to a lot of trainers right now saying, right, we're going to open our gyms next week or the week after. If we're coming back in middle, end of July, fighters are going to need anywhere between five and eight weeks to prepare for that fight. They have mm. to spar. So now you're going to have all these public gyms, sorry, private gyms opening and fighters will be sparring. So we're also encouraging the gyms to say, you can only let those guys come into the gym if they are tested. So you've got two, but the problem Who pays is, for that? Uh, we will pay for that. We will okay. pay for the entire testing. The testing per show, you're probably looking at about 30 grand a show just for individual testing. It's about 90 exactly. people. So it's five fights, uh, four people in the team. So you're looking at, you know, two fighters, 10 fighters on the whole card. 40 people, Matrim staff, Sky staff, British Boxing Board of Control. It is an absolute logistical nightmare. I've got, there's been times during this where I've got to say, I've been looking at it thinking, should we just wait? Do you know what I mean? But yeah, that's yeah. not really the answer. It's about making it as safe as possible, but it's about people getting back to work. You know, obviously we want our business to keep going, but we're in a different position, like, like Tony said, where none of these fighters are getting paid. And if you're at the top level, if you're AJ or if you're Fury, you're okay to wait till October, November. No problem. But if you're a kid that hasn't boxed since September last year, yeah. the last wage was five grand, 10 grand, whatever. Unless you've got sponsors supporting you, which again, they're probably now looking at, you know, any low far between grand a month here, they're, every, everybody's going to be cutting back. So we want to get started as soon as possible. Boxing is another level, but I just feel like, in boxing, and, and I go back to Jamie as well, the, the kind of like, I know this is a bit intrinsic into the, the business model, but for football, with insurance and stuff like that, if you're a player right now, do you go to the club and say, okay, so what happens if I play football and I uh, contract coronavirus and it affects my lung capacity and I can never play at the top level again? Mm. Am, I, am I insured on that basis? And the conversations I've had with the insurance company is not really, you know, unless the clubs want to play a premium that is unrealistic. For boxing, Tony, there's so much risk in boxing that the fighters, the fight, I sound strange, the fighters aren't, aren't almost aren't even not say, ask me about to, contracting corona. Not asked. They're thinking, I'm almost putting my life in the, on the line as it is. Of course. It's tough enough as it is. What I'll say is, is yeah, I think personally, Managing 22 players with three officials or four officials on the line on the other side, whatever it is, and then managers and then assistants and stuff. There's a whole lot more logistics that taking place in football with boxing. Let's just be totally honest. The only time that contact needs to happen is when the fight is actually getting the ring and the fight happens. So ideally, we only need the contact where it, that comes in is them two fighters. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand testing the teams and the trades and stuff like that, yet, yeah, but they should never come into contact with each other. So once one team's tested and another team's tested, the only two people that are coming together from outside the team is the fighters. So I don't see the biggest problem with boxing as I do with football. That's 11 different players with 11 different families, with coaches, with how many other different families. Do you understand what I mean? So if you, it, there's, there's so many more numbers involved in football and I understand that's going to cost a hell of a lot more money, which they do have in football. But as it, when it comes to boxing, if you're looking at putting five fights on, at the matchroom HQ, you obviously you've just said you know the logistics. You know how many people need testing, but how many of them people are going to actually come into contact with each other or need to come into contact with each other? It's only the two fighters really, and, and the, the trainers and his team. So I just don't think it's anywhere near as hard to navigate and find the way as it is with football. Tony, do you, or Eddie, do you think? Because I've been thinking about this from a football point of view. When there's no crowd now, I was a player who fed off the crowd, and the crowd I think made me play better when the crowd is up. I'm actually thinking in the football sense now. I actually think, for instance, Man City would be more suited to playing in an empty stadium than Liverpool would. 
Wow. No, what I mean is I think the Liverpool crowd, I think Klopp and Liverpool's team feed off the energy mean, of a crowd, whereas Man City are a lot more technical, mm. probably better with the ball. And actually thinking of the teams near the relegation, who's actually the better football teams? Is there actually something in boxing where there's fighters who actually, when you see them in the gym, they're not special, but then all of a sudden this crowd, right. the big fight night. Well, if if you haven't that, got that crowd, mm. would they be actually when it less chance of winning a fight? No, when it comes to the actual fight, don't get me wrong, yes, the crowd does play a part on some occasions, and it has done in my career, I'm not going to lie, but believe you me, mate, there's no two ways about it. When someone comes over to you and is going to punch you in the face with everything they've got in a pair of boxing with your mind, will soon switch on, and you forget about the crowd. I saw that on the SAS quick. show, you weren't happy with Big Fash, were you? It's <laughs> that. So you were definitely uh, happy on that show. Do you know what, mate, it's... Apart from when Brendan Cole was carrying you. <laughs> trying to keep it serious here, you ball bag. Uh, so, you know, it just, it, in no way, shape or form will a crowd take part when a boxing starts because it, your life's at risk, literally, mate. So, I 100% get it with football. Listen, Anfield has been a cauldron and broke my heart more times than I care to remember. But if Liverpool play again, do you, you know, do you really think that they're, they're going to stop playing that absolute quality of football because the crowd's not there? Do you think that Mane... No, no, I, I think out? Liverpool... No, no, I, I think Liverpool, <clears throat> the way they play the pressure and the energy, I've known myself, when you play a practice game and there is obviously no one there, there's just... Sometimes the crowd can lift you that extra 10%. Now, yeah. that's, that's every team, but I just think certain teams, and I think Liverpool definitely under Klopp and the, the, the energy and the intensity of the place makes them better than what not what they are, but it lifts them probably 5 or 10%. Mm. I'm just saying, I, do, I think with what we've got to get used to now, maybe for the next four or five months in football, I was just wondering if it would be the same in boxing, but in football, I think certain teams will be, not, no one's suited to playing an empty ground, you don't do that, but it will it'll favour teams more than more others, than if you others. like. And what I'm I saying is, I think that. Man City would be better in that situation rather than I, Liverpool would, if you I, like. I, I agree with that, but on the boxing front, don't, I, I'm trying to think of some fighters who would benefit more. What I do think what people will benefit an awful lot from more is the actual view and audience on TV when it comes to boxing. Because when I viewed that UFC the other week, mate, believe you me, it was mind-boggling the things that were going on. I was hearing that in Ghanu breathing. I, I listened to the wind go past his opponent's face off a punch and, and his eyes lit up as if to say, if this fucking hits me, I am out like a light. And his eyes just went like this. And... You don't pay that much attention to the little things. And I think it'll be the same in boxing. You know, when a fighter gets hit to the body, you will literally hear the grunt. You will know he's hurt. Uh, just little things like that will change it. But from a perspective of when the actual bell goes, it'll just be fight me and that's it. As in football, I think it's so much harder to, to think about it without the fans because fans have made football what it is now. It, it is just, it, it's took over the world. You know, you've got to understand, we're trying to get football. Football now, I swear to God, the way my mates are going on, is the most important thing in the world. It, it's the only thing that matters to about them. the restart of that and basically the economy. I, I, it's crazy. It's insane. I, my mates won't stop going on. I'm like, listen, lad, our life comes before your entertainment. And my mate said to me, it's not entertainment. I said, football is entertaining, you plonker. And he went, it's not. It's me club. It's, the, it's me life. On that tone, on, on that, do you think the footballers feel like they're almost, and Jay, like, almost like... He's in, he's, yeah, in this environment where it's like, oh, come on, lads, we've got to get you back. Welcome to being a fighter if that's how they feel. I've well, been a piece <laughs> of meat for 20 years, mate. Don't start me off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I agree. I mean, t to be honest, at the start, now all the talk's been about... TV companies, CEOs going into meetings, managers' meetings, but the ones who are most at risk or susceptible are the ones on the pitch, and they almost feel like being the last to be being spoken to. And we've had people coming on the football show, and, and the majority of them say they want to get back playing, but it, it has to be safe. We need to know more what's going on. There needs to be better communication. Like I was speaking to uh, someone on the phone the other day, one of the players, and, and they were in up to date with actually the proposals UEFA were putting in on dates and when the football had to be finished because people say oh just just play whenever play till it's it, let's go to September October if we need to but football's there's so much more too because there's so many other leagues in Europe and all the leagues need to be aligned because you've got the European competitions next season and 
you know, the lads I was speaking to wasn't quite sure of these dates. And I'm thinking, who's actually giving the information to the players? They need to be a lot more, know a lot more of what's going on, uh, really, because it's not easy for UEFA, FIFA, uh, the Premier League, really, to get the dates and keep everyone happy. I mean, you know, it must be a minefield. I mean, Eddie, you're involved in, uh, you know, the top end of boxing, involved with Sky and organising fights, but yeah, it must be tenfold, mustn't it, with yeah, the Premier League, with 20 different clubs all having different agendas. I'm the darts, I'm the snooker. Yeah, but I keep looking at this. I look at the football, and I, for all the problems we've got, I keep looking at the football going, my God. And I wonder whether they made a mistake by almost not consulting the players at an earlier mm. level. And it's almost like the players have ended up feeling like, hang on a minute. Oh, you, you're telling me what to do. Player, you just, you know, no one's spoken to us. And I feel like, you know, you, you always get powerful players, don't you, that want to speak up in, you know, mm communities or the unions and they sort of feel like they've been disrespected because they haven't been consulted but I just want to ask you guys Jay before we let you go about that performance level do we think that can work both ways as well you know we said about the teams individually that Man City might be more suited to it than other clubs but as individuals as well same question to you as well do you feel like some individuals might increase their performance without that pressure and that caution of, of a live crowd what do you think Jay no, I agree. I think there's some players who... I think when you go to the real top, top level, uh, I think the reason a lot of players play at the top level, I'm not the same with fighters, is because they, they can handle that, that pressure, yeah. that dealing with things. I think they may be a little bit lower down in the Premier League, near the bottom. Maybe players who maybe lack confidence, maybe the crowd on the back and it affects them uh, massively. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I was someone, and I think players I played, definitely fed up. A perfect player for us was someone who wasn't anyone thought was a great player, was a player called Dear Cout. You, you remember him, Tony played yeah. for Liverpool. And if you watched him in training, you'd think he was like a, a non-league player. You, you'd watch him in training. But whenever we played, in a, especially a big European game, and it was a night game, and the atmosphere was electric, and the Zen game was fast, was he'd look the best player on the pitch. And it was just like, it was unbelievable to see him. I remember speaking to Leighton Baines about him. He said he's the toughest player I played against. And I was like... Dear Kite, and he was like, Yeah, he just never oh, stops no. running, he feeds off the energy, the crowd, and he always had his best games in the big game. So, and you think you watch his quality level in training, but then he plays at his best against the best opposition because those games had the, the crowds right up for it. It was on television, it was normally a night game, the energy, and it become a different player. So, I think it will affect players, you know, in different ways. We had a player at Everton who was the polar opposite to him, Victor Anachibi. When he used to play, when the, the minute the crowd started to get on his back or the tour, he just his head dropped and he went and his mm -hmm. performance went down. But you know when he played away from home, he was a defender's nightmare. So strong, so quick, so powerful, and it was just it, different results. So as you've seen there, Jay's give you one example. I'll give you another way to flip the other way. So you won't know until it happens. I think when it comes to actual boxing. I think some fighters will benefit massively from it because they will see. Yeah, yeah it is. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. So it oh, is mate. a perfect example. Is I think if if the football does start the first game for derby, isn't it? No, oh, mate, don't remind me. No, but what I mean is Goodison. I know, I know Liverpool have got a great record against Everton, but in terms of mm. actually winning at Goodison, Liverpool haven't won that many times at Goodison in the last seven or eight years. I think they've only won once. A big yeah. part of that is the crowd, isn't it? You know, mm, that siren comes on at the start of the end, the crowd get right up for it. They almost carry Everton across across the line in those games, certainly of late in the last few years. So, if that's, that's the first game, there's no crowd there. That's it's where crazy. it may play into Liverpool's what hands. Your city, if that game's get, I mean... What, what, Jay, we both know, mate, people will come out. What? That, yeah, that can't happen at Goodison Park, mate. I'm telling you now, people in that city, they will come out. What happens to the city? I mean, it's just going to be madness, isn't it? This is why I, I this is why I said. I mean, I don't want to set. I don't know if it's the right thing to say doing this points per game and let the league go as it is, and then just leave it now. And and because I believe, listen, it might not be the right thing to say. And Everton's done it. He's given the people the league. He deserve it. He deserve it. He won it in November, in my opinion, mate. It was all over by Christmas. Uh, just give them it, and then let this thing calm right down for football, and hopefully. Come September, we're ready to go again, and the league can start. The biggest thing is if if this gets played out right, and this season does finish. Do you know when Liverpool lift the title, mate? My city's going to be like a carnival in Rio. 
for about a month. I'm telling you, mate, you don't understand that. I can't explain to you what football means in this situation. All it's, two metres apart. Yeah, sure. uh, Jay, <laughs> listen, mate, there'll, there'll be about there'll, there'll be people doing handstands on each other's shoulders, mate. There'll be people, they'll, mate, they'll be it'll just be ridiculous. And I'm just thinking, just give them it now. And, and let them. I mean, the, the problem the problem is, though, Tony, it, it's, it's not a bit. To be honest, I don't think Liverpool fans want to be given it because people say there'll always be an asterisk there. I think, listen, I think you know what Liverpool have done has been unbelievable this season, but That's it's the money. The world, I think if this if this was if this was thirty years ago and it was, there was no Premier League and it was the old first division, first division, second division, third division, I think the league probably would would maybe have just stopped and come back when it's ready. But I just think there's so much money involved in the yeah. game now. It's sad to say, but it, it, it's reality. Eddie's talking about getting the boxing back, or everyone's in yeah. business. Everyone's got to get money going, the economy going as well, but I just think there's so much money involved, you know, the teams in the championship, if they get into the Premier League, I mean, it just, it changes them completely financially, it goes the other way for teams getting relegated, it just, it's the financial aspect of it, almost feels like it's... What would you do, Jack, if you were the power, if if you were the power in hand, what would you do? No, I I think I, I, I'm really backing what the Premier League have done. Listen, because it's easy, I think it's probably easy to criticise it. It's Eddie or anyone at the top of an organisation, it's always easy for people outside of that to say, oh, they should do this, they should do that. The pressure on the Premier League now and people in football to get this decision right because it's so sensitive to people up and down the country is so, so difficult. But they know they're going to have problems going forward in the future. If there's no vaccine, when does football start? Mm. Would, would lower league teams go out of business? They can't allow that to happen. It is so awkward for them. I think they're doing a, I think they're doing really well in that. They're trying to make this the safest probably industry in this country for professional football. I don't think there's any much more we can do. Uh, really, so I'm sort of back on what they're trying to do, but as I said, they've got to try and get the players a little bit more on board. I think they will come round eventually. Watching Germany yesterday, don't forget it's another month before we're actually thinking the Premier League might come back. So I think the country will be in a different place, hopefully, fingers crossed, in a month in terms of how the pandemic's going. But I just don't see a situation where it can't finish really and because of the effects of next season in terms of the money. Legal threats from clubs, you know, Leeds and West Brom, are they going to take the Premier League to court because they, they were on the verge of coming up? If there's no relegation, uh, those teams or teams are relegated on points per game, how do they do it? Uh, will they go straight to the courts? And I just think it's better to be decided on the pitch than the courtrooms. Well, thanks, Jay. I really appreciate you coming on, mate. We've got Joey Barton coming on. We've got Troy Deeney. So, uh, we're going to... Jay, think- thanks very much, Lam. All right, cheers, boys. No problem. Thanks, you soon. Mate. Soon, and we bring in another fellow scouser here who's been waiting patiently. How are you, lads? All right, love to Survive hear him, mate. Love, great to welcome Joey Barton to the show. Joey, thanks for coming on, mate. I said you wouldn't believe it, and no one will believe it, but we actually invited Troy Deeney and you at the same time. You're not on together, so don't worry about it. But everyone uh, felt like it's all right, it's sound, so good lad. Uh, no, but we just had Jamie Carragher on. Obviously, you've played in the, in the Premiership, you now manage a team in League One in Fleetwood. And again, a lot to be decided on there right now. A lot of the conversations was, you know, we talk about boxing returning, coming back. From a player's point of view, one thing that come up in the back end of our Carragher conversation was, do you think that the players have almost feel like they've been a little bit disrespected here in the terms of, we've got to get football back, got to get football back, almost like without the consultation of players. I'm sure you've been speaking to the guys, but... It seems to be a, a small revolt from certain players about, hold on, we just feel we're being thrusted back into this. Yeah, look, it, it's tough for me to say because, I, as you rightly point out, I've, I've poked the same game. People now we're going, going the other side of the fence, Ed, do you know what I mean? And, um, you know, obviously, I haven't forgot being a player or, or what a player means and, and going from being a top-level player to working for the club in the third tier. It, it's a complete different ecosystem. You know, I've seen this morning, um, Williams said he doesn't feel safe or whatever it is coming back. And, you know, uh, Troy, I, I think I tweeted after I'd seen Troy's comments. And I like Troy a lot. You know, I mean, we've always got on on the pitch. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for him. He's done fantastic. Um, you know, he's, he's like myself. He's had a couple of issues in his life and managed to overcome them and use them to, to propel himself forward. So m- my take on that was, you know, the opportunism of any of the sides in the bottom six and, and you can't blame them. Um, you know, the Premier League's worth, you know, 
conservatively, you know, 120 million pounds to, to the clubs that get into the Premier League from the Championship. That's why wages to turnovers over 100 percent for for a lot of Championship clubs, such as the gamble um, to get into that top division and the, and the financial. Uh, rewards for that and, and I can understand every player's got kids to feed and a family and you know they want to you know be at the top table and in the top door as long as they possibly can so you know I, I commented on uh, I, I didn't actually um, directly uh, tag in Glenn Murray but I'd seen Glenn had said something about it on GMTV so I went back and watched the interview and he was talking about PPE and he didn't want testing to be taken away from um you know, people on the front line and obviously the hospital staff and that kind of thing. And that, that, that's completely understandable. I totally get that. I, I, I don't disagree with any of the lads on, on those points. The problem I have is that, you know, no disrespect to Tro Troy and Glenn and William and Aguero and Sterling, who've all said they don't want to play. They don't feel safe. No problem. Don't play. No problem at all. But I guarantee you now there's a 17, 18, 19 year old kid who's been desperate for a chance to play in Watford's first team or Brighton's first team or even Manchester City's first team that, that, that will want to play, that does feel it's safe to play. I've got a lot of lads in our care who want to play. My players want to play. You know, they don't, they don't have a surplus amount of cash in the bank. They, they, a lot of them live week to week, month to month because we don't earn that kind of money down at, at this level. You've got 1,400 players um, in the lower leagues out of contract in a month's time. They're not going to be paid. They've got no money in the bank. They've got kids to put in school. They've got mortgages to pay, cars to pay for. You know, and, it, and if the government are saying it's safe to go back, we've just seen Germany go back yesterday. We'll probably see Italy go back in a couple of weeks' time. If the Premier League boys don't want to go back because they don't feel it's safe and they've got the money to be able to do that, no problem. Don't go back and play. I'm not forcing anyone to go and do what they don't want to do. But there's a lot of clubs that need to get on with it, Ed. If we don't get on with it, there mightn't be any football. If we wait for a vaccine, it might be a year time, might be 12 months, uh, sorry, it might be six months. Some clubs won't survive that. They, they, they can't physically, you know, if the government stopped furloughing and there's no crowds coming into stadiums, we're going to have many, many clubs in a situation that we've got at, at Berry this year where 120 years of tradition are gone because of mismanagement for a couple of seasons. It's, it's scary times for a lot of these smaller clubs and these clubs underpin the communities. You know, we're not talking about the Premier League behemoths and the, and the money that they've got because, you know, they'll be fine come what may. They can stop playing for another 20 years. They'll, they'll all be okay. At this level, lads, you know, non-league lads are going to need to get back going because they'll supplement a lot of their incomes with, with the money they earn on the weekend playing non-league. Um, and we, we need to think about the whole ecosystem, not just... The, you know, the multi-millionaires at the top who can say, well, I'm going back to Brazil like William has and, and I haven't had a holiday because I've played for the Brazil national team and Champions League during the week and I've gone Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday for the last 10 years. So I've had an eight-week period here where I haven't done anything and I can chill out with my family and enjoy my money back in Brazil or back in whatever it is, Argentina, where Aguero's gone. So stand, you crack on, enjoy your holiday. You, you kick on, mate. You, you enjoy that. You've earned the right to do that and you've earned the right if your club are going to pay you full whack because it's Man City and they've got billions, um, you've earned the right to say, I don't feel safe to play. But the rest, the working class sport that football is, we, we need to crack on if it's safe to do so. And if the governments are saying it's safe and our, and our FA and EFL and Premier League are saying, you know, it's safe. And I've been on League One meetings this week, Ed, so I've listened to doctors speak. Um, it, it, it's never been a, you've never been safer to be a footballer in a coronavirus uh, pandemic. Going to be two tests, temperatures taken, all these, all these things put in place to to make sure that a football stadium restart and will be safer than, than most places in society. You know, I, I said I'll have to go to shop. I've been volunteering for the for the NHS volunteers, and I've been going out and do, doing people's laundry, going to shops for, for for people who can't get to do there. Now that that that's riskier for me than it will be managing a football match because there's going to be so much testing and protocols in place. It isn't when I go to Tesco's or Asda or Marks and Sparks or wherever you've got to go, a pharmacy. Those people aren't tested. So I went to the Liverpool game against Atletico. Our last game was on the Tuesday night against Portsmouth. Portsmouth, a week after we played them, had three players test positive for coronavirus because they played Arsenal in the FA Cup on the Friday. There was no concern for our safety then. You know, there was no, oh, you've just got to stop playing there, lads. We had to play through it. 
Um, luckily, none of us got the none of us got the, the virus. Um, and you know, at some point, we have to return to normality. If we don't, the economy will fail, and the football economy is is already creaking now. So I don't know about boxing lads, but yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, the same thing. Far away. You know, fighters, you know, Joey, get paid when they fight. You know, mm -hmm. so obviously the majority of fighters, same kind of thing as in the football. You know, the guys who haven't earned the, the million pound purses, etc. Uh, those guys are going, oh, I'll return when I'm, you know, when you tell me and when I can train properly and etc. The other guys are going, stick me in, stick me in. And it's a dangerous enough sport as it is. I mean, I always mm -hmm. said to Jamie uh, just now, I'm talking to Tony. You're fighting almost for your life in the ring a lot of the time. So these fighters actually aren't overly concerned about contracting the virus and they're healthy. But I think the, the amazing thing with you, Joe, is that you've been at all the different levels. So, like, for instance, mm. we used to own Leighton Orient Football Club. We're doing, like, a million, a couple of million a year. You know, you know, the, the chairman of Fleetwood, he's got a few quid. But you know now, being involved with those clubs, the intrinsic budgeting, you know, the P&L sheets of those businesses, they are an absolute disaster, aren't they, all round? And especially for you guys that have worked so hard to try and get promotion, you're, you're on the brink, aren't you? So a move into the championship would be massive for Fleetwood. And not just for Fleetwood as a football club, but also for the town, for the community, and everything that goes with it. For, for some of our players, it's the, la it's the last chance saloon to play in that league above. Um, and that might be the difference between being able to pay the mortgages off um, and not, pretty much, Ed. And, um, you know, I know that shouldn't be a, a consideration when we've got a lot of people losing loved ones. And I totally get, you know, we, we have to um, take measures to protect the NHS. For the last eight weeks, you know, myself, my family, all of, all of my players, you know, we, we've observed that. We've, we've done everything we can possibly do to make sure, you know, the, the reason we stopped playing football in the first place was to take the strain from the NHS to make sure that we get over this sudden spike in, uh, in cases via this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I think we've done that. Um, you know, I think everybody in society has, has, has played their part on the whole. I think, you know, we've been fairly well behaved as a nation. I seen Germany go back yesterday um, from what I watched on the TV. I didn't see any fans congregating outside of a stadium. Um, they, they seem to uh, behave themselves you know, sensibly. Uh, the games, you know, look like they got through without any um, any problems. I've seen the UFC go back uh, the, in the last week. And and I'm looking at it going, OK, I know some people aren't going to feel safe. There's, there's people out there who are more anxious than, than other people who are more GM and, and virus um, aware and, 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 and uh, concerned about, you know, people that they care about who've got underlying health issues. Unfortunately, in society, for us to restart and get back to some form of normality, we're going to have to take a leap of faith at some point uh, until a vaccine comes out. And, and even then, you've got you know, all the fellas who were burning down uh, the 5G masks are, are all on the vaccine one now, aren't they? So you know, there's going to be probably World War Three if they start offering a vaccine to people and uh, you, know, the, 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 uh, you know, can't get on flights if you haven't had this vaccine and all that. So... You know, it's, it's going to be a long, long time before we re return to normality. I mean, if we ever do, if you ever can, through something like this. Um, so so we, we've, we've got to get moving, is my take on it. And, it. and if, you know, for me as a man, I'm a father of three. I'm happy to take that, that calculated risk based on what I've been told about all the testing, you know, all the, all the distancing that will be in place. Obviously, it's disappointing that we don't have crowds in. But I think in the short term, we've got to do that to get back moving to then hopefully get the crowds in at a, at a, at a safe point in the future. But if we don't get back moving, um, what, what, what are we going to do? Just sit and, 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 and just stay in our houses and, you know, we, we, we and watch the clubs go out of business and watch, you know, as you say, people go out of business. And that, that's not just the, the 11 players or the 20. Is that a contract that there's, you, you know, yourself, Ed, from Leighton Orient, there's, there's hundreds of employees who are, who, you know, our, our club sits at the at the focal point of the community. It's a real community hub. That's the way the training ground's built, um, and it, it's not the most affluent part of the world. And a lot of people use that that um, that facility as, as a meeting point, as, a, as as their sense of community. Of whether it's going to game on a Saturday or to our training ground with the kids from a Monday to Friday in in, in the academies. So. 
and I know it's not safe to do that just yet, but I think the first baby steps for that is the the the, the, the senior teams getting back playing. Um, I think once you do that, I think people will start to you know lessen on their anxiety and will start move, to move back to to normality. I think oh, yeah. you touched on a great point there of saying you are at more danger going to the supermarket than you are actually in and amongst a football match. That is a very valid point because there's that much testing that's so stringent that he's right, mate. Listen, I'm going to as there or Morrison's or Tesco, whatever it is, at least once a day yeah, to get stuff for the family and for the kids. There, I don't want to let it go out. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it, it's not a um, it's it's not something that you know. If I'm being honest, that I'm I'm not concerned about. I mean, I don't want to give it to anybody else. I think mm. I might have had it. Um, I went to the Liverpool Atletico game. As I say, we played Portsmouth. I definitely had some of it in the first two weeks. We self-isolated. My missus had it, fortunately. Um, everybody else who, who lives with us didn't, the kids, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, for the last seven, eight weeks, you know, fine, no problem at all. Um, and, and I get that you've got a social distance, as I say, the, the, the Royal Volunteers thing I've been doing, you know, you go with your gloves on and you, you make sure you're protected and, you know, drop pick something up on the doorstep and then take it back and drop it back off at, at times and, and you'd observe what the government give us as guidelines and, and you know, touch wood, that, that's been as safe as it can be. So, um, f- for us, I, I think, as, as a country, you know, you've got, we, we were two weeks behind, I felt, Italy, Germany, Spain in, in the, in the pick-up of this uh, issue and it almost looks like we're going to be about the same again it, it, when it comes to you know restarting our economy and restarting our ma- major industries. I just want to ask you one the question. UFC one, I just wanted to ask you on that. What do you, what do you think on the UFC? How do you feel about that in terms I, of... I felt boxing? they come back too early because I just thought ethically it was all a bit early. You know, it's, again, it's not like... The social contact involved there is on another level. But I spoke to Dana White. I have to take my hat off to him because... They've, they've got it over the line. They've done like four events now in the last week. I think they had two guys or three guys test positive. I found it quite compelling watching. You know, me and Tony were talking about, you know, the, the punches landed and you can hear the fighters breathing. And actually, I think from a, in terms of a spectator sport, it's actually probably more intriguing than it is watching footballers play behind mm. closed doors, you know. So I feel like they've done a great job. We're going to be trying to come back in July. The mission, I mean, over Texera and the Smith, the UFC, and I was fascinated about how much coaching was going on, and they were saying yeah, we the adjustments for the coaching and whether that was actually helping or hindering the fighters. And I watched Dortmund and um, and Munch and Gladbach um, one after the other yesterday, and yet I think you can hear the players talking a lot more and hear the, so so it will mm. be novel. I mean, it's not the same. You know, you can't you can't recreate it without the fans in in any sport event. The fans. Obviously, at a, a camp event. You know, camp. Sorry, I've, got one, I've got one final question, Joey, before we let you go. Oh, mate, you know, I, I grew up, well, I think, you know, it was, we're all similar ages here, right? When I grew up, you were a right tear away, right? You were a right pain in the arse. You're always getting in trouble, etc. You two are from the same city. We had Darren Till on last week, which was actually really interesting. You, you're very opinionated, you're very opinionated on situations. Where do you think? the kids are today. We were talking about knife crime last week, particularly in the city of Liverpool. What do you feel like is the problem? You, you've you gone from, you know, you, you've really transformed yourself into that kid that was getting in trouble. Do you think that's just maturity? What do you think the prop the kids are faced with these days, particularly in, in your city, that, you know, to overcome? What is the problem? Because I want to hear your problem. You've always got plenty to say on it. And you've kind of been, been through all those stages, like, like Tony and Darren. Yeah, I, I, it, it's such a tough one to answer in. I know it's a bit of a curveball, but I just I like to hear about it, you know. It's a tough one to answer. It's more more question time that Ed than um than... <laughs> you have though. You've changed so much. You're a different person to where, where you were ten years ago, aren't you? I, I, I think we all are, aren't we? Isn't that isn't that mm. it's, yeah. it's a famous comparison, do you know what I mean? You, you know, you, you should look back on yourself and see how far you've come and changed. I mean, I remember Tony working on the doors in society. I just not say the first time we met. Yeah, years <laughs> years. <laughs> If you'd have told me, did you sling him out? No, he was very well behaved, yeah. mate. He was brilliant. He used to come down and have a yeah. laugh. Um, and, and to the queue when he was writing. <laughs> he was always great. And, and to go look back now and think, well, I was buzzing to see Tone obviously go on and be world champion and do 
incredible things for himself and his family and the city. And, and you know, you, you're so proud to see lads who you know who, who were given the role on a daily basis change their lives. And, and I think, you know, I see that until now, legitimately top five in his weight class in, in, in the world. Um, and, and I know a, f- a few of them lads who stayed in, in Team Cabon and, and, and the work that they put in. And I think that, that that's the that's the key. You've got to give young people uh, opportunities. I think that sure. the where if, if people are given opportunities and support, look, we all we all fuck up from time to time. I've made more mistakes than anyone, and, and you still need that close circle around you. you. You've got the Smith brothers in who've done you know wonderful in the boxing space. Great family, great boxing family. Um, Liverpool's you know historically produced you know really good footballers, really good boxers. Um, it's now producing, you know, good martial artists, and it's produced great music, and and I think it, it's a weird city where everyone believes in themselves, and it's it's a very very competitive city where I would say there's a lot of you know there's a lot of green eyed monsters. Everyone, oh, all right, so well done, yeah. you know, I'll uh, walk away. Oh, he always tells me that. Who the fuck does he think he is? <laughs> Liverpool's yeah. that kind of city where you have to accept criticism, and you have to accept that. People are going to judge you because there's a lot of people with a lot to say, and we're all um, mega opinionated, um, and, and we all believe in in ourselves and our journey and our family, and, and that's probably what what propels a lot of us to achieve things that that nobody, you know, thought any of us were possible um, of, of of doing. And I think you know, if you're a young kid in Liverpool now, I think back to when I was a kid, Ed, you know, what were my options? Get out via sport. Um, sell drugs or crime yeah. or go, go in the military you know the, 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 there's not you know in, in the face of the Tory austerity program and, and, and the Thatcherism you know fallouts and all the things that happened to the, to the northwest of England you know there's, there's, there was a lot of kids with not a lot of options for Tony it was uh, football or, or boxing probably uh, mm-hmm. for me it was a similar field um, you know school could only take me so far. I went to a, a council school, the, the, the place I come from in Liverpool, a place called Heighton, um, as the I think second high, highest unemployment rate in, in, in the country. It, it's got no sixth form provisions now. It, it did have, I think, when I was a kid, but it's got none now. So you leave school, where are you going to go? You've got to go to college or university to get on in, in the academic space. And if there's no provision for that from our because our council just doesn't have the money doesn't have the resources what are you going to do you know you're going to go and work for jaguar on a on a on a zero hours contract my brother worked there you know you're on all the shift patterns you know your job's not guaranteed if you turn up late once you're gone you've got no pension no um you know nothing if you, get, if you go off sick you know, these kids just don't have options they don't have a chance um and if we don't provide places for them to, to, to grow, then then the dark parts of the world will 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 no doubt attract them. And you know that leads to all the crime and the and the and the and the problems that, that we don't want to see for, for our young people in, in any city. You know, London's probably as bad as anywhere on on the on on, on the European continent at, at the minute. You know, it's you reading in the papers, it, it seems like, you know, South America, you know, there's that much knife crime down in London now. I've seen, was it Delhi Alley's pad got got yeah, based yeah. the mm-hmm. other day? Yeah. Uh, wow. uh, Statistically, I mean, made the country's finished when it comes to kids and knife crime. I just don't see a way out of it unless you start really punishing them properly. And I'm talking properly. Get caught with a blade, you're getting a good sentence. What is, you know, when I was a kid, I only ever got a, a knife pulled on me once. I was, I was. Uh, on a school bus coming home and um, there was a mad kid on there anyway and next minute he pulls a knife out and you know I, I, I'd like to think I could, I could look after myself with my hands but I wasn't going to take the chance when he pulled the blade out so obviously you just get on your toes um, you know that could have worked out a, 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 a different way and um, fortunately enough I was able to get off the bus and get out um, but but most of the lads who carry knives um, can't, have a, can't have a scrap so, mm. so that was always my, my take on it. And nowadays what you're getting is, you know, these kids, you know, they haven't got many options. They also mm. know that loads of people are doing jujitsu, loads of people are doing boxing, loads of people are doing MMA. And they know they'll get filled in if they kick off. And they rob someone. It's cowards got to take knives, mate. It's mental. You know, they have to carry it because in London now, if you're not carrying a knife, 
and, and you get you know I, I went to town as a kid on the bus um, with your mates and and if there was more lads in certain parts of that, our city centre than you and your mates you got everything took out of your pockets like that's just you know you'd have to fight for what for what you had you'd get, you'd get robbed um, in certain it's parts been the same for years yeah. don't make cowards cowards taking weapons yeah. like my last fight I had before I got expelled from school I got stabbed in the head with a compass three or four times but fortunately enough I actually smashed his jaw with my fists uh, yeah, that, but, that maths teacher's never been the same since then time. Yeah, mate, it was another pupil, you muppet. Tony's from, but, Tony's from a different part of town. You, you're from that, that kind of South End, so aren't you? And you're... Yeah, Wave, I was born in Toxic and raised in Wavertree, so yeah, I went to school in Chilwell Comp, and as I say, mate, it was just it was madness. I the, the last fight I had, mate, I say, getting stabbed in the head with a compass three or four times, but fortunately enough, I carried on fighting because it was with my hands. Uh, but so many situations in our schools, kids going to school with knives, kids starting to go through schools, it's just crazy. And I say, until the police really toughen up on sentencing and my plan, it ain't going to go away anytime soon. All right, well, listen, I think that's a that's another conversation and another show to discuss that. But, Joey, I want to thank Definitely. you so much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate that. Joe, and thanks very much, Lam. How's, how's, how's your old man? He's all right. Yeah, he's good. He's back. Well, he started off, he had his heart attack, then he's, he wanted to call me in for a meeting and tell me how... He was going to step back, and now it's been three weeks he's over the world again. Telling me how excited he is by all these challenges, so that we just let him crack on. Do you know what I mean? So he's uh, he's a clack. I send him to the guards. We're lucky, Joey ain't got late and Orient anymore, because then the heart attack, he wouldn't have survived the heart. Yeah, yeah. I imagine now, yeah, they're all stressed out. We we haven't sorted our league out, so they're going back on Monday. They had a deadlock, and we've got um, obviously Sunderland, Peterborough, Wickham all scrapping for one playoff place. Yeah, so yeah. It looks oh, like yeah. we're going to get it if they go points per game. So, yeah, well, that and needs a learning. The, um, the, the Pompey owner, he's going to go, he's going to go yeah. bizarre. I'd go, I'd go nuts. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's out of order. We should yeah. finish the, the league. Oh, hopefully he will, mate. Hopefully he will. Fingers right. crossed. Good so, speak, good luck, mate. Thanks for having coming on. See you soon, champ. Cheers, Ta-da, mate. La. Cheers, mate. Hello, hello, hello. Boy, how you What's doing? That, Listen, firstly, I want to apologise. I know you've been waiting a long time, you know. you know. Are what? we blaming Tony? No, yes, it's Tony. always my fault. Always <laughs> my fault. I, I kept my mouth Tony, shut in that look, whole discussion then, by the way. Stop. Troy's coming on. He went, Troy, who's that geezer? <laughs> uh, but thank I, you. Eddie with the staring we, tactics again. I to firstly say, Troy, I promise you, we didn't intentionally have you and Joey Barton on the show. We weren't going to get you together, but the good news is, he spoke some great things about you, actually. So you it's just some of your praises, to be but, fair, mate. But my God, no, 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 it's all, it's all good. He can talk. He's a very, he's a very educated, opinionated man. He can, he can talk. He's, a, he's an intelligent fella. I don't, yeah. I don't have any um, disagreements with people talking. I talk most shit out of everyone, but just I've got a big deal on that, mate. Yeah, just don't, don't talk, um, just don't talk about things you don't know. Is what I would say. Mm. That was it. And just don't bring my name into it. If you bring my name into it, we have uh, issues. But that would be it. I'll speak to him man to man. It'll be sweet anyway. So. Yeah, he was, he was good. He was good. Can I just say beforehand, although I was waiting and I was I was getting a bit pissed off, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to say something to both of you two, off air or whatever. Tony, you yeah. like are one of the very few people in this world that I absolutely admire and respect. Oh, and thank you very people. much, mate. And, and Eddie, you're a prick. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's exactly the Please same on to on a business financial level. I think the way that you're changing the game has been oh, for sure of inspiration to someone like me. And in this time of like sitting down and having a lot of time to think, I just think it's better to tell people while they're alive and well. Do you know what I mean? So, thank you two massive influences on my life. So, thank you. I appreciate it, and I'd swap what I do for what you do any day of the week. So if we can go back, mate, and swap, I'd absolutely love to. Right after these last nine weeks, I, I wanted to put some people's head in. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Like I spoke to Andy. You know, Andy represents yeah. him. And yesterday we said, look, we get Troy on the show, and he was like, look, he'll do it because he really has respect for Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Thinks you're a prick, like, but you know, don't. <laughs> 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 Normally, what happens? <laughs> but um, I saw you Eddie in Feb or March. I think it was Feb. We're both at the same airport. Really? Um, I'm I, hello. Yeah. Oh, I saw you with your missus. Right. I left because I was with mine. We was going to uh, Marrakesh just for a few days. 
Mm. Um, and I was going to say hello then. I was going to say to you then, and I thought, oh, he's with his missus. I bet he's like pissed off of everyone going, oh, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. So I just like left you to it. And I watched you. You put some food away in there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Man, what battle? Let's be fair. We're all, we're all facing an ongoing battle, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? You're not you're right. top, you're get not the tops up. He's got a six-pack head. Don't be picking on him, lad. <laughs> you lift your top up, lad. I, I, must, admit, I must admit, <laughs> Roy, you are in shape. And I know you work hard with Jamie and Tone. You're still cracking on, but... We've all had our battle. Yeah, we're all still, <laughs> still, we're all still I'm still high 15 stones. It's, it's, it's oh, not, is that what you are? I'm like 53 at the minute. But when I'm playing, yeah, I'm you, must, you, you must be a nightmare for them for them defenders because them defenders nowadays, they're not used to a player who wants to get up close, rough and tumble like the old players uh, used to. So they yeah, don't they're like playing stones. against you. All the way back to Carl Stone Tone as well. That's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the only I'm, one I wouldn't like is that Van Dyke. He's the only one because he's just massive, quick, he's horrible. And well, I seen you I seen your uh, interview, mate, when you said I mean the horrible fucking eating smells nice as well. Oh, mate, he's got his <laughs> hair, Beautiful, mate. It's annoying. It's annoying. <laughs> fun. He's oh, mate, Eddie, that is some lovely attire in your room there, some lovely furniture. I'm glad my miss it's terrible, isn't it? You know what I've realised? Like nice. when I done when I done my gaff up, it was about ten years ago, and I swear it was cool at the time. <laughs> Now I'm doing it, it's like everyone, everyone in their background's got like grey and white and silver. I'm like beige and gold. You know? <laughs> That's nice. I like, I like that. I the opportunity to come and visit my uh, grandmother this morning and do it from her house. So, you know, it's, it's all good. It's a classy mate. look, lads. A classy look. We've got such a serious show, Troy, to be honest with you. It's sorry, like, sorry, sorry. Troy, I just want to ask you about, we, I, we've, we've talked so much football on this show. I just want to talk briefly. We, we, it was quite interesting. We spoke to... Carragher, who's kind of like from the broadcast side and the Sky side. We spoke to Barton, who's obviously played and also from a League One side needs to get his club back as well. For you, is it a case of, well, what happens? I know we've, we've said, and I understand your comments, and obviously that resonates with Tony as well about the family. And Massively. he said earlier that, you know, wouldn't we be better off just binning the season off, keeping everyone safe, then coming back in September as well. But what happens with you, Troy, when the clubs say, we're going back? And we're going back to training in next week or the week after, and we're going to play. Well, that's what that's what ultimately has happened. So we're due back in this week. Um, I've said I'm not going in. Uh, fucking hell! They told you to. You're going in. Yeah, we're all in this week. So part of phase one is every Premier League club should be back as of month. At some point this week, they're back in. So I've said personally, I'm not going back in because it's nothing to do with. And I know Joey mentioned it. Like but it's nothing to do with financial gain. It's Absolutely. Hand on heart. If I would go to full detail about it, about my personal situation, everyone here would go, no, no problem. Fully understand what you're saying. But then I think that my problem was within the meeting, I asked very simple questions for, for black, Asian and mixed ethnicities, there's, there's a four, four times more likely to get the illness. We're twice as likely to have long lasting illnesses. Is there anything extra, any additional screening, heart stuff to see if people have got problems from that? No. Okay, well, I feel like that should be addressed. If going forward, phase two and phase three, which are going into smaller groups from three to six people, is there a clear layout if we hit certain targets that will transition into the 11 v 11 stuff? No, it's six days at this, seven days at that, and then a week until you play it. Because they want the first game to be the 12th of June. So we're only like three and a half weeks away from that. So my thing is just to transition really fast. While we are getting tested and while we are going to be in a very safe environment, it only takes one person to get infected in the group for that to be a one to a six ratio. And again, I don't want to be bringing that home then. I've just had, a, my son's like five months old. He had breathing difficulties. So I don't want to come home to put him in more danger. There's no, that 100%. There's no, um, you've got to drive it in your own kit. You can't have showers. So there's a hygiene mm. aspect of that. Then you've got to drive back home in the same dirty kit you've got. And if you are being contaminated, I don't know if it could be passed through clothes, but they couldn't really answer that question. But if I'm putting that, then clothing in with my son's clothing or with my missus' clothing, it's more likely to be in and around the house. And um, yeah, I just, I just said the simplest thing, like I can't get a haircut until mid-July, but I can go and get in a box with 19 people and jump for a header. Mm. I thought, oh, that mm. works. And no one could answer the questions. And not because they didn't want to, just because they don't know the information. Yeah. So I said, if you don't know the information, why would I put myself at risk? And 
I think he got blown out of proportion when I said I've been broke before. Like, I don't want to go back to being broke. None of us do. Of I'm just saying I've been broke before and I've made it to this point. It's not a big deal. Yeah, but if I've, I've lost my dad, my, my nan, my granddad, I've lost more or less everyone that I care about. That, to me, is more important than a few quid in my back pocket. That's, that was the point I was trying to make. As soon as you mention your son, it's a no-starter. As soon as you said your son has been there, then no, it's a complete no starter. So one hundred percent get it. I wouldn't do. I'd be exactly the same. So uh, I didn't know people from different different ethnic backgrounds. So as you know, my mother's black, so I didn't know that that was the case. Uh, for that, so that hasn't been uh, described either. She's gone back to work. She's working on a takeaway part in in the restaurant she works at. There, they're doing takeaways now. So I didn't know that at all. You see, uh, there's so many That's things so I've just learned from that. That's government guidelines, though. So it's mm. that's actually like from the big man himself. He said that. So that's mm. out there, um, and there's studies to show that it, it, it's real. Um, and it gets us as well, isn't it? The case of if you got infected with a disease. Talking about obviously the family issue is paramount as well. But as a player, if you got infected with a disease and you had a problem with it, which you say you might be more susceptible than others. That could affect your longer term career as well, couldn't it? I mean, it could affect your lung capacity, could affect your ability to make money, you know, to transfer to another club, all these things as well. And I think that one thing I said to Jamie was that do you feel that the players almost have been disregarded in this respect? It's almost like that we've got to bring football back. There's too much money for the club. The Premier League want to go sky on the TV, much yet for the subscribing for content. Hold on a minute, what about us? No, I agree. And, um, Again, it'd be very easy to sit here and play the victim. We're not a victim. No, no. We was a scapegoat when it comes to the NHS stuff, I felt, because there wasn't a big there wasn't a big call out for, you know, boxers. You know, we've got a lot of wealthy boxers. Mm. One this chap. Um, you know, Eddie, maybe, you are you I mean you did have a couple of amateur fights, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm skinned. I'm skinned. Me miss has got a few crew, but I'm skinned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there was never no clamour for anybody else to do, you know, make a big public. I think that was disgusting, to, just to say, just to butt in, so I think it was disgusting uh, attacking footballers in there, where you're absolutely disgusting. Why you've got hedge fund companies in this in this country that refuse to pay more than 10% tax. I know of a company that's absolutely huge, and he met a chancellor and refused to pay anything but 10% tax from him and his whole company. There's companies that are on wire attack footballers. 90% of footballers come from absolutely nothing, very similar to how I was in boxing. 90% of them, I'd say. You know, footballers is a game that, that is, is basically from the streets. Let's be totally honest. That's how kids have made it. It's a way out. You know, it's just our country is being built on keep the rich rich and the poor poor. And attacking footballers was just a cowardice thing to do, in my opinion. I don't know why they agreed. I mean, I think it was a nice touch when Joe Anderson came out and said, we should do this to help. We should. Why don't... Yeah, why don't... Um, there should be... There was conversations about doing something. Uh, it's just when it, it gets pushed in and it's kind of forced. Um, I do agree. That's why footballers and boxers get on so well because it's a common denominator that most people are coming from, you know, low income or from certain areas. Um, but we're all, we're all progressing to try and make ourselves and our family better. So that, that is what it is. I just felt that when it comes to footballers, it's an e you're an easy target because Sky are reliant on us. Not as much now the boxing is coming in on a, on a regular basis, but if you'd have went back maybe two years ago, you'd probably say, maybe even three years ago, we'd probably say that Sky's main input was football. Oh, it still is, for sure, yeah. yeah. still is, mate. It's the king. But, um, you know, we look at all the shows that you guys would have had to cancel as well. That affects your market. Uh, I know myself, I was massively looking forward to Billy Joe and Canelo. Yeah. It would have been unbelievable. And then the, the month you had going on, Sky would have stood to make loads of money, but again, not what many people know. We got asked by the Premier League to take 35% wage cut right across the board to cover the gap between Sky and the Premier League. That was six weeks ago. Then it was the NHS stuff. And now it's, uh, go on then, you're not really that bothered. Go back to work and you know, figure it out. We haven't really- As I said, news have now become, mate, like we used to feel as boxers, a piece of meat. I, I, I understood that towards the end of my career, I am nothing but Saturday night entertainment. That's all I'm locked upon. And if I'm not around, someone else will entertain. I think now footballers have now realised that you are Saturday day's entertainment and people's entertainment 
is more important to some people than fucking life. And that is a sad society and situation we're living in when entertainment means more than someone's life. As I said before, we can come back from this. We've come back from other things in life. You can't come back from death. There is no comeback from that. There is, there is one thing that was raised, which I thought was a very key point. And um, it wasn't from me, it was from somebody else. I don't know if you want to name it, so I won't say it. But if you think of it now, Eddie, and you look at nursing homes and people like that who are struggling with um, PPE protection and, and tests, they're not getting it. As footballers, we stand to have nearly 3,500 tests per month throughout the league. Then every staff member will have PPE. At some point, if there is a second wave, which they're talking about happening, Again, it's going to come back to look at these spoiled footballers getting all of this and somebody yeah. in a care home here is... Can't win either, yeah, they can't win, but always, it's the players. No one's saying, well, why the Premier League giving out all of this? Why are they making these funds available? It's always the players, the players, the players. And that's where I think... Now, I've had a lot of calls from up and down the country. I didn't think people actually expected me as much as they do, but a lot of players getting in touch saying, I'm with you. I'm just not ready to speak. I think, well, I think it comes to a big problem. I, I think, you know, you speaking out, Danny Rose, I saw another player speaking out as well. Yeah. I feel like there's going to be a problem. And I know that our teams work as well. You're all talking, you're all on WhatsApp with each other and stuff like that. It only takes two, three, four, five, and it's like, okay, we're not going to do it. You know, we're not comfortable with this. It takes one person to test positive in a team and everyone's like, you know, and on the boxing side, there's more contact than ever. But I'm sort of, I'm delaying it. We're talking about middle July, end of July. But there's almost no rush because there's going to be less boundaries to overcome mm -hmm. the later we go. The longer you so wait. Don't know about another spike or the numbers might keep coming down. And in a month's time, you might look at it and go, okay, yeah. I'm happy then. At some point, at some point, we are going to have to take a risk. At yeah. some point. We're all aware of that. And again, I want to make it very clear. I can't wait to get back to work. I've got four kids. This homeschooling is, is driving me. I've been planning to get in the gym every morning by like nine o'clock. And I ain't got in before two because I'm doing school work, I'm doing breakfast, I'm doing all these different things that I never would ever do. But I definitely want to get back to playing. But I do think that at some point we will have to take a risk. I just don't understand why we can't say, I don't know, let's say the, the, the start date is June 26th, let's just say. I don't even know what date is. And work backwards. We have to tick this box, this criteria, do this. Death rates have to keep coming down. And then we go back to work. At yeah. that point, I, I, I can't complain. But at the moment, we're saying, let's go back to work because Germany are doing it. And Germany are in the hundreds um, of deaths per day. And we're in 600, sometimes creeping up to 700. And, and we're taking that as a comparison when, when none of the stats are incomparable. So, yeah, it's, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, but Ultimately, we're all we're all safe at this moment in time, so we have to be thankful for what we've got. And I'm not one to keep throwing the negativity out there all the time. Did, did you watch the Bundesliga yesterday? And how do you feel as a player about playing behind closed doors at that level? How, how crap was it? Let's just be honest. How yeah, crap was it? Were they, <laughs> were they piping in crowd noise? Yeah, that's what that's one of the things they're trying to do. Yeah. So, and, and even the bench we about fighting. You know, we were talking about you know we saw the UFC start up back recently. We're looking to go middle end of July. Yep. It's going to be, I think you need to, like, as a TV product, you need to create that intrigue of the fact there are no fans. But when you're talking about UFC or fighting and you can hear the lever, and yeah. you can hear the guy, someone gets hit with a body shot, it's like, oh, and you go back to the corner. You see the UFC guy goes back to the corner and he says, my teeth have fallen out. And you can just, <laughs> <laughs> the football level, it just looks a bit weird. Yeah. And all you're going to hear is, the absolute swear words, left, right, and centre, no matter what they yeah. try to do, you know, <laughs> people always swearing. And it's, for me, it's the weird thing, because in boxing, you say, you're in fighting, you hear that, and you go, oh, that's a good shot. Yeah. In football, you hear that, oh, he's passed it six yards. <laughs> <laughs> he's passed it seven <laughs> yards. <It's> seven. <laughs> and like, just some of the other things, again, I don't really want to go to, but like, you can't spit. You're meant to slide tackle and look the other way so you don't get up and be face to face. It's like, some of the things that have been, spoken about are, are borderline embarrassing and it's just you know it is a product it is a product we're all aware of it again i gain from the financial aspect of it of sky B. so football being so big with sky and all the broadcasters so i'm not going to sit here and slam them because it and ultimately it's changed mine and my whole family's life so 
I'm happy with that. But I watched the German football for about three minutes and went, this is shit, and did yoga with my kids. That's how good it was. <laughs> <laughs> right, we want to go, we're done with football. We want a couple of last questions on boxing. We know you're love. I'm going to bring this up because I know Tony's back to AJ. I know you and AJ are close as well. Ooh. AJ Fury. It's, it's, it's the one we want to see, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a scrap, isn't it? It's a proper scrap. You can make an argument for why both would win. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I thought Tyson against Deontay Ryder was, was probably one of the best heavyweight performances I've seen in a long time. He uh, it dominated from start to finish. And we were playing Man United, and I, I was, I, we stayed in the Hilton in Manchester, and I was downstairs with all the, with all the punters watching because I didn't have it on in the rooms. And the atmosphere in there was like, it was just everyone was quiet, just going, what the fuck's happening? What's happening? It's meant to be a proper scrapper, and he's just schooling it. Um, obviously, AJ is my power, is my boy, and I'm always going to back him. But I can make an argument that he'd have to make it rough and ready. And, yeah, 100%. And it would be who would, go to, who would go to the trenches at the two of them, and you wouldn't want to go against either of them mentally, or, 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 or different animals, aren't they? I know Josh personally. And his mindset to just keep going is frightening. And obviously, everything that Tyson's been through, his mindset is, is questionable. Tony, when you look at him physically, yeah. look at Tyson Fury, we know that he's massive, six foot nine or whatever he is, but mm. he don't look that strong, does he? I mean, no. you, I've been watching him do his home workout videos recently. Mm. He's given me a lot of inspiration, to be honest. <laughs> I'm looking at him and thinking, oh, I think I'm actually in better nick than him. And he's the world ever. <laughs> Yeah, I've told you, mate. Yeah, I he's think got to get rough and ready, but just yeah. not because Josh is built like an Adonis mm. doesn't mean he can go in there and sling Tyson Fury around the ring. For years, I've been telling people that bodies don't win fights. It's a true saying, mate. Yeah, and I, I, st- that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I stick by it, piss off you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and it, even more so with someone like Tyson Fury. See, the things that Tyson Fury does doesn't actually come down to aesthetically how he looks. He relaxes when he fights, which is the most important aspect I can give any fighter. That means he doesn't ever tire. If he's relaxed in the ring when the punches are getting sling and when he's still being defensive or when he's on the move, he's not going to get tired. He can do it all day because it's at his pace. I understand why Fury's now the favourite, but you're just completely taken away the, the attributes of Anthony Joshua and if anything AJ's now proven that he can box in different ways because going into that really the Leeds rematch he just made hard, he made easy way of such a mammoth hard task and everybody's seen that he's now able to adapt he's not just a wrecking machine anymore he's not just someone who goes in and knocks people out he's allowed to come box he can box on his back foot front foot whatever he's not just a knockout machine mate and I think there's so much more to actually come from I, th- I think no just to add to that though I think the balance is a key thing. I think when you watch Wilder, even when he's knocking people out, his balance is all over the place. But it's a bigger question with society, though, Tony. Sorry, we're going a little bit deeper. I don't probably want to do no. that podcast. But <laughs> it's the way that everything is, though. We've built AJ up. He's the king. Yes. He's the king. He's lost. Oh, we need another one. Because remember, Tyson Fury, four or five years ago, no one wanted to speak about him. He of course. Was negative. So you do you do have to take it with that where everyone goes, well, we all want Tyson to win now because we saw what it, he's done. The depression and thing and the coming yeah. back from the abuse That's and stuff it. like that. We've all had our tough times and tough moments. Just I, I, When I look at fights and I, and I look at judging them and how each fight's going to be, I just purely put it down to what does he do well, what does he do well, how do the attributes come together. And yes, there is a case you can make. Tyson Fury could frustrate anyone. I mean, Tyson Fury could fucking frustrate himself. He can be that frustrating at times. Uh, but I just think someone like AJ, who's been through so many different things in his career so early on, as he's, had, he's been in this huge fight. He's had domestic dust-ups against Billy and White. He's been in every... He's been knocked down. He's been beaten. He's been stopped. He's been in every situation you could possibly put a boxer in. Has Fury been in the same positions as... AJ, I don't think he has yet. And, and I just think AJ will find a way of getting close. The only way to beat Tyson Fury, in my opinion, I've always believed it was, you've got to have someone who doesn't care what's come on back and gets right in your face and throws punches. No. And he's good enough to get there, by the way. Because you don't why the child, but technically, he's just he's that far apart. He's not good enough to get there. AJ doesn't usually care what's coming back. And I think he will jump on Tyson Fury and there will be no avoiding the speed and power. It's as simple as that. And listen, don't get I could be wrong. Yes, I've been wrong loads of times before. But that's my opinion. 
I'll stick to it. Styles make fights, and I think actually Joshua gets rid of Tyson Fury in six rounds. And to be totally honest, it's better that be in the six rounds as well because if it does go past six, you've got a really, really tough problem on your hands. And someone who weighs that much and somebody who can manoeuvre the way he does manoeuvre, I think it's only going to go downhill if it does go past six. I think you've got the um, sorry, editor. I think you've got the Messi Ronaldo comparison. No in football, mm. you, people either go you like Messi or you like Ronaldo, and it's you like Fury or you like Joshua. I'm more of the can we not just sit back and go fuck it? How lucky are we? Love to two of them. Watch it? Yeah, how lucky are we to watch a pair of them go at it and and still be around and say in twenty years time, oh, I remember watching that or I remember seeing that fight. Honestly, I think I honestly think as well, like from behind the scenes, especially I think maybe with everything that's gone on, just makes people realise, you know what, we we better get this made because we can't fuck this up, we can't lose this opportunity. And I really think, you know, I, I know AJ's got to get past Pool Evan and Fury probably got to beat Wilder again, but I'm really sure we see this fight next year, twice as well. I, I think, think we will. I think anything can happen in both fights. I think Fury, I know AJ, like the back of my hand, he wants this fight more than anything. Fury has always wanted the big fights. And I think even Fury now looks at it and goes, do you know what? I need Get it made. I, AJ said to me the other day, we've got eight more years, you know. And I was like, yeah, results. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, think, I think Fury's thinking, I'll probably do the AJ fights. And I know he talks about, why and stuff like that. But I think he's looking at those two fights and going, I don't blame him either, by the way. Wilder, AJ, AJ. And then whatever happens after then, I walk into the sunset and I'm done. But there's something inside AJ, and you know Troy as well. It definitely ain't about the money. Mm. Definitely ain't about the money. No, he's just he's set out long ago. But he's constantly trying to better himself. He constantly wants a challenge. And, you know, Troy, we're talking about doing these shows in the matchroom headquarters, like in a garden. Yeah, and I was talking to him yesterday. He goes, "Oh, I'll be well up for that." And he's like, "Yeah." He was like, "That'd oh, be unbelievable." I said, "What really?" I said, "Yeah, you box Wembley, Millennium Stadium, Saudi Arabia, MSG." Yeah, but that, imagine how intense it'll be. And he said, and he was talking. He's like, "Some people just don't want to fight, you know. Mm-hmm. Like they just, I want. He just, he wants to get in there. He's training already. Like he's got the keys to Finchley. He's going in there. He's training twice a day. He's a proper competitor." AJ, mm-hmm. and I've never really met anything, and not, not just to lick his ass, but his energy around you like, as an individual. I've never got off the phone to him, or I've never not been in his company and walked away and felt uplifted and positive, you know? Yeah. He's a quality, quality geezer, and you know, for the dough that he's got and the money that he can make, honestly, it's just about fighting. He absolutely loves it. I think he's such a great role model. So, no, I agree. I agree. And again, for me, um, again, not licking your ass because you're here and you've got loads of grey hair showing. But the man in this is definitely the same for me because I said it before I interviewed Tony, Cal Brook, a lot of grey, yeah. like people like that that I, I've never met and had a proper conversation with. Um, I generally go like, if we really must have met in a pub, I'd sit there for like 10 hours and we'd just talk so much shit. But we, you know, like you feel like you connect with somebody or you can relate yeah. to somebody's story. And that's how it was with, with you and with Cal Brook from probably the last mm-hmm. 10 years or so. I'd be like, oh, I think I understand his story. Oh, I think I get what he's about. And then obviously with Instagram and now you are starting to post more, obviously with the kids and stuff. So I think you were a bit, mm. uh, but definitely like me anyway in that sense. I didn't like to put my kids out in front of it too. I don't, yeah, I don't agree with it, mate. I just much, start, uh, so I don't do it too much. Yeah, there's too many idiots and I, I can't take the, uh, you know when you know they're trolls and the someone goes, don't bite, don't do it. You read, yeah. it, you read it, Troy. Do you read them all? I read it all. Yeah, I read it all. But you made me read it all because I watch all the IFLs as well because I'm busy as anything. So when I'm on the bike at like <laughs> a minute, like for an hour or so, I put your ones on. Yeah. And I'm not just saying these Frank's ones are a bit boring. I don't really watch Frank's. <laughs> they just never got me. Because and I've, and I've called Coogan out of it as well. He asks you questions, he doesn't ask anybody else. He reads himself. Correct. Correct. Yeah, mm-hmm. he can, people like that as well. But like, honestly, I always sit down with him. And mm-hmm. I know, and I won't stitch him up, but he, when he sits down with people, certain promoters, not mentioning, yeah. they say, say as it is, Eddie. Don't say it how it is. Say it how it is. And some promoters ask to see it before it goes out, right? Yeah, of course, but that's why you've, you've transcended, and that's why the younger generation now are doing that because. You appeal to them more. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 
but business minded as well. So you're always finger on the pulse. You know what's going on with the twenty year olds. Mm. Whereas I, even me, who's thirty two next month, I'm going. Fuck it out. These twenty year olds are a bit live. They're, they're forgetting that ten years ago that was me. Yeah. With your finger on the pulse, and I think that's why with business you're able to evolve and do so many shows. And the work rate is that as well. So you see, like Michael Jordan, yeah. if anyone's watching the yeah, you, have to have a, you have to have a passion. Oh. Um, do. Like, and I think I always look at fighters as well for, I think this goes for football as well but the sport is so brutal that when you get to that top end like how do you maintain that passion and that you're pouring that, your toe fucking hell nah don't be daft it's not me I'm, <laughs> I'm punchy lad too many punches I'm missing it <laughs> but it is isn't it like you got to go through that system of getting up every day I always look, look back at Naz you know when Naz went and boxed Barrera and he had that nice villa in Palm Springs and he was looking up into the mountains of Big Bear and going, oh, look, Barrera's up there. What was he doing up in the mountains, you know? Fucking soon and found out why he was up there. I know, I know. But it is and I love Naz, but he soon found out, mate. No, no. But you've got to have a passion for what you do. Troy, I've got one more question before Tony falls asleep. Yeah. Um, Fuck off, ball bag. And that is because you, you talked about going deeper early, and I know you're quite passionate about this as well, and I brought it up mm. with Jerry Barton as well. Nothing about the football. Is We know where you come from. You come from Birmingham. You know, you, you had... Uh, tough upbringing as well. What do you think the problem is with the younger generation today? We see knife crime. You know, London's a major problem. Liverpool, Birmingham, probably. Birmingham is a big problem. Troy, do you know what I mean? But yeah, what do you think the problem that these these young kids are faced with nowadays? Honest opinion, and I'm probably not going to be liked for it. No fear. Mm. There's no fear. There's no. There's no fear of, of no respect. Reper no repercussions. I'm a big believer that respect and and an element of fear starts within the household. Don't mm. get me wrong, some people don't have both parents. But even like my dad was locked up a lot of the time when I was a kid, but my mum made sure we was bang at it. Like, went to school, didn't mess about. The only person I fear of than my dad was my mum, even to this day. And uh, I, had a, I can still remember the two times I got told off. I got a slap off my mum for being cheeky in, uh, in Marks and Spencers. I was giving it loads, and my mum was like, shut up don't embarrass me in front of people and then my dad when I swore for the first time when I was 14 put soap in my mouth the old school one which went bang straight in there but he mentally done me as well so I went to do that and he just went straight on my hand and just went straight to the back of my throat didn't yeah. swear again until I was like 20 so um, I do believe that is a big thing but also you know having been in the, in the prison system it's not as it's not as focused on rehabilitating people as it should be, in my opinion. Um, and, and opportunities. I think boxing, football, I think we could do a lot in the communities as well to show different ways out. I think we, the hardest thing is to get somebody engaged passionately to say, like, this is what I want to do. But I think the bigger thing is you have to show there's a financial gain. So you don't have to show that you, you don't have to be the AJs. You don't have to be the Tony Bellews. You don't have to be the... Ronaldo's, you could be a Troy Deeney and still um, vast amount of money, look after your family and be set for life. I think we put an expectation of you either there or you're there and there's a big middle. We know boxers and, you know, I'm trying to think, someone like Cal Giffey, real solid boxer, had a real good uh, record up until now, earned decent money, but no one would ever put him as a role model, but he's a great kid, both mm. of you guys Freeman. Should be a massive role model in Birmingham. But yeah, but like I say, I'm from Birmingham. Not many people know about him. No, I know. Sad. But he's a lighter weight and doesn't speak. Yeah, and I went to the Birmingham show. And I sat next to you, Eddie, if you remember that. Mm. And we, um, and obviously when AJ was there, and we, and he struggled to sell out, not because of people don't want to go to Birmingham. Birmingham's a weird one, Troy. I've got to tell you, like when we go, when we sell an arena, you normally do like fifty percent through the ticket office at the arena, and fifty percent the fighters. Are out selling tickets locally in Birmingham. It's like five percent of the ticket office mm -hmm. and eighty percent of the fighters. It's yeah. a, it's Liverpool's fight, are yeah. very similar, Ed. Huh? Liverpool's very similar, mate. You don't yeah. want to buy and you don't want to spend. But they'll buy it. They believe in the people. So when yeah. you come out or when any of the Smith brothers come out, everyone will go. I know him. He's a good lad. But well, even then, so it's a tough sell. Yeah. Even then, now I come out as a world champion, defense. Birmingham's first ever world champion. You know, we've still done 5,000. But you'd think that the city would say, fucking hell, you know. Get behind them. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing tool, though, isn't it? I see how, I, I think I see how you do it, Eddie. You, you, 
you give your you built your platform and then when you sign a fighter you put it on your platform as well so they have an instant engagement and then you kind of go go on then keep it going keep it going and if they keep it going they'll build an engagement box not everyone is built that way not everyone wants the responsibility but i think the next time you get a a big prospect like we've got shaq and pitters who's a mine yeah so he's got a chance because he's very much he's got a good story he's engaging Mm. but again does he deliver on the big when you give him the chance on the big show if you deliver and that way once you're then in you've got to bring the whole city with you and, and that's both. what we need we need more of a production side on people's backstories people need yeah. to understand and know the fighters and that is a huge thing that's what I touched on last week with the UFC do so well everybody's yeah. got a backstory everybody knows where he's come from what he's done uh, and with these prospects that should be how it goes going forward and the match room and what we have in place going forward is to get that backstory out a lot more because there's only so much time so much can get on Sky Sports so the backs, uh, the, you know, the scenes behind the behind the fighters are what needs to be seen more. And as I say, that will draw even more fans to the table on the fight nights and in the stadiums and stuff like that. You know, it is a huge thing that should be taking place. Just, just Troy, finally, uh, I know we kept you a long time and you waited. You know, I, want your, I want to talk about your career. Yeah. How do you see it playing out? For, I mean, first of all, we've got to get you back on the pitch and we've got all stuff. Yeah. You've been at Watford a long time. You know I mean? Just a quick one. So how did you end up at Watford and not Brum? I was at Warsaw, um, which is just outside of, of uh, Birmingham. And uh, I used to be a builder, so I got in there. Like, the story of his love, I was pissed I played, and the geezer was watching, he was watching his son, and I scored a few goals. And I was playing in men's football. I was 17, at, 18 at the time. Wow. He moved to Warsaw anyway. And then um, Watford. Watford and Charlton wanted to buy me. And at that point, I was on 180 quid a week at, um, at Warsaw. I was player of the season, top goal scorer. And I was on 180 grand a week. And they sold me for 300 grand. And Watford put me on four and a half grand a week. And again, from my community, that was like, wow. if, I, if I save money for a year, I could buy the house and then I could do this. And my only goal was to have um, a house in my own area and a holiday home. Because nobody in my family's ever owned a holiday home, so I thought like, oh, if we could do that, we're the, we're mustard. So four and a half grand sounded like it was, it was a big old go. And uh, I soon, it is meat. And I soon realised that I spunked it up the wall every Saturday with all my pals. And- <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, so yeah, I went there, and that was it. I kind of went there, but along the way, I've turned down like a lot of big moves because um, I. I I've kind of become synonymous with Watford. I could go and move to another team and just be a bit part player and get a few more quid, but my rise as a man and Watford's rise as a club again has kind of gone hand in hand. So I, I do feel passionately about it. Do you it. feel like that? Do you think that players feel like that nowadays? Whether there's a move, nah. like, it's a bit like fighters. You know, when you've got a fighter and you might lose a fighter to another promoter or, and, and you kind of think, oh, like me and Tony, we've never had a contract. Yeah, but that's um, good enough to sign him. And, and secondly, <laughs> geezer. but it is like it, I, I feel like they're a dying few. They're a dying breed, and yeah. especially in football, where actually you got a guy that goes, "Yeah, I've turned down a big club, but you know what? I like it. I love what." But they gave me an opportunity, and, and I think that's that's yeah. that's quite unusual. Mercenaries. Yeah, but I think also in in the game now, everyone is very much aware that the club uses you as much as you use. Of course. Him. So. The respect to loyalty has to go both ways. Um, mm. I've noticed the more you go from 28, 29, 30, they start going, that five-year deal, maybe we'll do it as a three now, yeah. or do it as a two with a rolling. But a lot of it comes to respect. And, and um, I'm fortunate with the owners that I, I've got that they didn't know who, who I was when they took over. And obviously, I was in jail when they took over. So when I came out, um, our owner was called Gino. So I literally just went... Hi, mate. I'm Troy. Lovely to meet you. Sorry for the fuck up. And he was like, who are you? <laughs> I was like, oh, number nine. Like, oh, you're that one. Yeah, so sorry for the fuck up. I won't let you down again. And everybody else is kind of like looking at me like, you don't speak to the, the big boss. I've always just took people as people. We earned a lot more money than me, but still a man. He's still got a kid. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I just shook his hand and said, it won't happen again. I promise you I'll make it work. And then from then on, I've gone on to to do what I'm doing and, and we've always had a relationship whereas whenever I've had a contract discussion with him it's been a I want this I'll give you that meet in the middle then yeah done it's never lasted longer than a week to get it done so 
pretty similar to you and Tony, I suppose. That's brilliant. It makes football just could learn so much from that because these days, mate, everyone is out for what they want. Agents are so involved and everything is crazy. Very few footballs have the same mentality as true. We'll just go in there, sell what they want. I'll give you this. I want that. Meet me with the shake hands. And it's just not like that. With me and Eddie, mate, it was much more complex than that. Believe you, I used to have for over the pennies, never mind for pounds. But in the end, mate, he was a. It was very, very good and very fair. That's the the one thing I always say to fighters in or outside the match room. I've dealt with other people high up in boxing. Yeah, I've been at the highest heights, and the one thing I always say to the match room is, you have honesty. And if you have honesty. Anything can be sorted out. So only people are being honest with you, you know where you stand. And sometimes, honestly, you might not like what you're hearing. You know, you might not like that you pay me this much, I want this much. So it's simply Richard not there. Do you remember when you drew Richard Ember at the first fight? I don't remember anything from that night book. Yeah. But Tony boxed a guy called Isaac Chilember, who was a really good fighter. He was a final eliminator for Adonis Stevenson. And it was a draw. Right. Was that Liverpool? Did that in Liverpool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a draw. I felt, I felt it was a solid draw, but you know, uh, when the final bell went, if you'd have given me a draw, I would have gone, I'll take it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I went back to change rooms. Tony was going berserk. Oh, fuck, you know, I won that fight. Blah blah blah. It's a joke. I'm, you, you brought it to Liverpool, and these British boxing border control. Blah, blah. I looked at Tony and I was like, I was half shitting myself to be fair. And, I was, and it, you, you, you weren't putting it on me, but and I just went, listen, mate, I think, I think a draw was a fair result. And you went absolutely berserk and then I just sort of slipped out the back door as well. Yeah, right? I don't remember. I thought that's one of the nights. You went back and you beat him in a rematch in a, in a good fight. Yeah. You know? so, I mean, mine was blank from that night. I don't, the, last, the only thing I remember, you have blank spots in your career. Mm-hmm. I just remember leaving the old cell room. That's the only thing. I, I, I don't remember anything but waking up the next day. So, can I, can I ask you one, one personal question? Of course you can, mate. Ask me anything. How have you found the transition from... Yeah. I know you've got Sky and then you've been on TV and you're a massive mm. superstar with the SAS and all of that. I get that. <laughs> but just the transition from having a structure of, I might fight in six months. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have this short time to enjoy the family, relax, and I get back into training camp. How have you found the oh. transition from... Pro to retired life. Hard. Yeah. Extremely hard. Purely because I don't have nothing to focus on. That's why I've done the SAS thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's nothing to do with physical. I couldn't wait to start getting fat. I couldn't wait to start well, getting fatter. Uh, I couldn't wait to start doing things. Uh, I've loved spending time with my kids, obviously, as always does. Uh, I've, I've got to know my 14 year old over the last two years better than I have done in the 12 years before it. So that's been nice. But from you know, you still put your head on the pillow at night and think what am I doing tomorrow? Or and yeah, I might have a good property portfolio, but it basically runs itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want that? What I'd say, best thing to say is, mate, I can never replace the focus that I had when I was fighting, and that can never be replaced. It doesn't matter what job I do, or how many things I do, I that work alongside my team with Ed. Uh, I've got sponsors that I still work alongside. It doesn't replace the pure. Buzz that I used to get from prepared and knowing I'm going to punch someone's fucking face in. I, I miss that so much. And the desire, like I used to turn up and little legs cold, I'll be able to tell you that I turned up at that gym mate and I would give every session everything I had every single day. And that's what I miss. Doesn't matter how many times I got my fucking pellets on, how many times I got out of my bike, I still can't get that buzz back, mate, of knowing I'm going to war and, and I'll do a deal with it. Eh, I don't know, you know, just day to day. I just try and find no, things to focus on. I don't I don't see I feel like when I look at a lot of people, even mm. though we look at like Mike Tyson potentially coming back and I think that's a massive mistake. But mm. I feel like mm. they, when they retire, they're they're, they're chasing that buzz. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, you're, I think you're embracing the kids' side of things and saying, well, that's you know, what I think, Troy, as well. You get people who like Ricky Hatton or like that that buzz, you might want to find it in drink or in drugs or like mm. just you imagine, I mean Playing Premier League football must be amazing. <sighs> Imagine I scored my goal. In arena to have a tear up and a fight, and you train you train like a caged animal for twelve weeks, and you get out. I think the the big problem with fighters is if you haven't achieved in your career. I think with Tony, like because you won a world title, because you you know you made your dough, because you had your fight at Goodison Park, because you all did did this. 
it's kind of like you can sit back on your couch and watch it on tape and look at the belt. I'm at peace with my career. That I, I can't yeah. say that. Yeah. I'm at peace with my career. I, you know, people say I overachieved or whatever. So I think that I'm happy. I, I achieved more than my wildest dreams. My that last fight was a throw of the dice that I never, ever thought would ever be possible. It was the undisputed unified cruiserweight championship of the world against potentially the greatest cruiserweight that's ever lived. So my career, it's not a question. I'm at peace with that. I'm at peace with my boxing career. When I look back at my career, the first thing I think of is just go to some park. It's all I think about, mate. I don't think about the fight with Hey. I know that might disappoint some people who are watching this now. I just think about Goodison Park and the amazing night. It was the greatest night in your whole career. I just wish it could have been over at that point. But what you struggle with then is, as I say, that day-to-day folks, you know, I know it's a bit tough at the moment and we're all in different times, but you know you're going to go back to work soon and you're going to start training. And that day-to-day goes off, I've got training in the morning and it's competitive, like, I'm on the iPad all the time playing competitive games. It's like this fucking jigsaw puzzle I'm playing it against someone else. And I love anything where I can compete against anyone. Like I got on that FIFA and this bastard embarrassed me playing me. Yeah, and I was doing it for this NHS thing. I wanted to kill him, literally. And I just realised that that buzz in me will never go. Yeah. That Middleton said to me, the minute you lose that buzz, there's no point in being alive anymore. You want to have that competitive streak in you. So, I'm trying to find ways. I play footy on a Thursday and eight to seven aside uh, to keep that competitive streak alive in me. That's the hardest thing that I'm finding. Uh, and that's what I just got to keep doing things that make me competitive. So if it's playing footy, if it's playing fever, if it's getting on the peloton and beating some big fat fucker in front of me, then just catch him. If it's getting out on me bike and ride my whatever it takes, that's what's been making me tick for the last 36, 37 years. Just the competitive side of me, always wanting to prove people wrong. And that's what I've got to keep doing. Right, well, that's only supposed to be an hour show. We've been done an hour with Troy. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I really appreciate Don't it. Don't be saying sorry, lad. Thank you for coming on. You know, I, I really respect your opinions and actually you speaking out and everything you say makes sense as well. So whatever your decisions, mate, we wish you all the best and we'll see you at a show soon. No, definitely. Enjoy. I don't think we're getting yeah. your back garden, but definitely. No. <laughs> <laughs> in the office and watch from the window or something. <laughs> no, when, get you, on the uh, roof. when you get the next shows on, we will definitely yeah. be there. It's it's great. Great. Amazing to speak to you, mate, your inspiration. Thanks. Take yeah. it easy, laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you all. Take it easy, brother. Well, well, stop talking. We're only supposed to be about an hour a show. I think this show is going to be like two hours, but what a show. Do you know, mm. like, it's amazing when you speak to people. I mean, Cara's Cara. We know Cara. Great guy, intelligent. I've got to mm. say, found Joey Barton really fascinating and we actually only had about 15 minutes with him he's a proper intellect i mean hugely opinionated you know he's he's got and, and troy deeney as well i mean what a, what a real guy not the two of them on soft meeting as i said before when it comes to joe let him talk you know yeah. he's, he's a clever individual troy deeney is someone i've looked at from afar for quite a while uh, inspiring the story coming from his background where he's come from the trouble he's been through in his life to get where he got to now uh, and he's also just highlighted, I've been watching the Bleeding News for how many months now, and he's just highlighted things that I didn't even know from watching the Bleeding News. So it's good points that he's got across. Uh, you can't knock either of them and any of them. And then finally, to finish off, you've got one of the faces of Sky Sports on a car. Uh, yeah. It's always a pleasure seeing my fellow Blue uh, on, on, on with us. Exactly. Listen, I really enjoyed it. Great show. Thank you. No bang in trouble, because when you watch this yeah. Monday night, and obviously, we're filming this on a Sunday morning. My missus is going to be I can imagine yeah. Rachel is about to be... Yeah, I've just got a look. So that banging that you can hear is air banging. That's it, air banging. One of the baby's bottles. Let's go and have some Sunday lunch. Hernandez, <laughs> Talk at Talk, episode four. Thanks for watching. <laughs>